You guys read Revelation? Yeah. Yes. It's been a little while. Yeah. You just read it, right? Okay, what do you think of when you think about the book of Revelation? It's confusing. Fair enough. I think it's equally comforting as it is terrifying. Okay, good. I agree with that. Yeah. All right, so we agree it's hard. Sometimes it's cool and sometimes it's a little scary. All right, how have you seen it portrayed in the media, like on TV, in movies? How do, how do you think the world perceives this book? It's a harder question. I'm not sure the world believes this. They think it's more like Hollywood, this couldn't possibly happen to us. Right, right. But you've seen, it, you've seen stuff from the book portrayed. Pop culture loves yeah. the book of Revelation because the images are so weird. They're like, this is great. You make, you know, that thing in Revelation, yeah, with the beast, I ah, ah, will do that. You know, so they borrow a lot of stuff for movies, especially like movies about demons and stuff. Um, I think usually it's, the, most people don't believe. There's only a handful that do believe. Right. And then one of the ones we watched, it was, they showed it as like these spirits, you know, coming through and snatching people up. There's, there's all kinds of movies out there that yeah, there are. portray that. They also portray it as something that if we work hard enough, we can stave it off. Oh, yeah. We can overcome it. Well, yeah, you know, and if, if we don't reestablish, you know, the, the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus won't come again. So we've got to do that. We've got to be friends with Israel. People get that out of Revelation. Yeah, they do. No. Yeah, they do. And it's a lot of American evangelical Christians that do that. It's like, what are you talking about? I don't okay. think it matters what you do. He's going to come. Yeah, and it really has nothing to do with Israel. It's like, but they're God's people. No, they're not. We're God's people now. But we'll get to that too. Okay, so is the stuff in the book of Revelation stuff that's happened already? Stuff that's going to happen? Or is it happening right now? I think it's both. I think it's, it's all three. It's, it's all of the both, right? Yeah. It's yeah. probably both. I think and there's some that we're, we're seeing foreshadowing of like one one money coming about. We're seeing some of the, uh, the way... Um, world powers are changing and everything like that. I mean, we're seeing a lot of foreshadowing and some of it with the United Nations has kind of happened, and, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot to come, I think, if I know it correctly. And some of it's happened before. So yeah, I think it's weird. all like over a long period of time, not, not just this, okay, it's yeah. the end in the last 30 days. It's, it's a great time period. Yeah, so if we look at, well, as we go through this book, we'll, we'll come to understand exactly what's going on. And, and it'll answer all those questions that people are, don't you think we're in the end times? Yeah, we are. We have been for like 2,000 years, but okay, we'll get to all that. So everybody struggles with the book of Revelation the first time that they've never been. I mean, you can buy, you can buy commentaries and you can, you can read about it, but it really helps to have someone teach it to you that you are like listening to. Then it really begins to click uh, because what's in it is it's not the easiest book in the Bible to read. And... Oh, commentators will actually tell you, well, before you begin your study of Revelation, and they're talking to like kind of preacher types, like before you study your, uh, you know, your begin your study of the book of Revelation, make sure you have completed Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, <laughs> Jeremiah, uh, like all they're all this stuff in the Old Testament. Like basically, make sure you have your Old Testament memorized, and then I'll let you start reading this book because all the imagery comes out of it, uh, and there's reasons for that, and we'll we'll talk about that. Some people talk about, you know, like, well, different parts and then in Revelation, parables and stuff like that and, and the imagery. And when you ask somebody about the imagery, well, what do you see? Somebody says, somebody else sees something totally different from the same description. I think it's that way on purpose. Oh, so it absolutely so is on purpose. People continue to study because if it was all cut and dry, the people would read point. it once. I never thought of like, it that way before, well, yeah. but you're probably right. There's, then, then and there's a real big reason why it's like that, and we'll get to that right away. But yeah, that, that's a, I never actually thought of it that way before. Because it's so weird, it intrigues everybody and they actually read it. It forces people to read it again and again and again. Yeah. Well, and isn't some of it, he was seeing images, God was giving him images. Oh, it's all visions. Way in the future, which there would be some way, no way for him to interpret mm, what he was seeing. That's what a lot of, of people think, think, and that's not actually true. Because like I mean, they are visions, but it wasn't something that John couldn't But I understand. mean, like if he saw a vision of a helicopter... How would he explain but, that? But did he have a vision of the helicopter? I don't know. And we'll get to that. I don't know. There's one where they're saying it could be, but I don't know if it is. <laughs> well, yep. we've, we've seen some, some DVDs where... Oh, yeah. They're, where they're, they talk about all, all that 
messed up. Yeah, they, that, that is a common interpretation of that particular vision. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, we'll Good. get to that one too. Yeah. All right. So a lot of Christians struggle with this book because of the influence of all these movies, popular culture, uh, false teaching, to be honest, misinterpretation of it. Because uh, if you misinterpret this book, you come up with all kinds of heresies like the rapture. Like, where's the rapture? And it's not. It's, it's not. You don't get it from this book. You, I see how they get it, and it's because they're misinterpreting it. And it's got to do with structure, and we'll talk about that too. Because once you get through it, it's just like, oh, this makes perfect sense. It's weird. It's very weird, and I don't get all the references from the Old Testament, but it makes sense. It will make a lot more sense to us. Okay, so first thing is setting. All right, this is set. We are in the Roman province, independent province of Asia Secundus, which is what we call Asia Minor, uh, which was founded uh, probably in the 800s BC, and then moving forward into where we are in the, in the late first century. Uh, that is now modern day Turkey and parts of Greece. Okay, now of course ruled over by the Roman Empire. So Rome in the first century, this is just the first century, Rome was ruled by Augustus, who we know from the Christmas story, Tiberius, Caligula, yeah, that guy, uh, Claudius, Nero, who we all know, fiddled while Rome burned, Galba, Otho, Fatellus, and during the time John is writing, the Fla what's called the Flavian dynasty, which is the uh, emperors Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Uh, why, are we, why do we have all these emperors? Well, because they started you know, like fighting among themselves and killing each other. Uh, Vespasian, we owe, uh, we owe the emperor Vespasian uh, a, a debt because he's, the reason the Colosseum is still around is because he uh, saved it from being demolished because they start, the reason all the ruins in Rome are ruins is because they started pilfering all the marble to build other stuff. Uh, and the Nero's, I'm sorry, Vesp uh, Vespasian built the Colosseum. Uh, it's Constantine that saved it. Uh, Nero's house, his mansion, was where the Colosseum is today. And then they uh, demolished that after they got rid of that whack job and they built, built the Colosseum. Okay, so why do I mention all these emperors other than they had an emperor? Well, because something very widespread in the Roman Empire was emperor worship, which began right around the death of Julius Caesar. So, and then he was, of course, the first emperor. He didn't, he didn't call himself that, but then uh, Augustus was uh, Julius Caesar's nephew, and that's how that all got started. Uh, and so he changed his name to Augustus the August, right, the stately one. Uh, and then he got himself declared a god. He mm -hmm. died, so he's the divine Augustus now. And all of a sudden, whoa, oh, hey, all the, all the emperors are now gods, kind of copying Egypt, the pharaohs declared themselves gods. Uh, so emperor worship was pretty widespread. And when you go out to the prov provinces, you'll see little temples erected to especially Augustus right after his deification. All of a sudden they sprang up little temples, which the Romans were used to that because there's like a bazillion gods, okay? So the Romans adopted the gods of the Greeks, changed the names, but pretty much kept everything the same. And then every time they conquered somebody, which was a smart way to do it, is they adopted the religion and the gods of whoever they conquered. So they just added to their pantheon of gods. And then in a Roman house, when you walk in, there's a little altar, and that's your household gods, and you sprinkle them with water or a little wine or a little olive oil, or you burn a little incense, and you pay tribute to your household gods that it keeps watch over your stuff. Uh, so you have household gods, and every household has different gods. And if you decide to get a new one, you put a new doohickey on the shelf and you have a new god. It's all, it's all false images and idols. So they've got gods everywhere, everywhere. There's a bazillion of them. So, okay, the emperor's a god, let's put up, okay, great, the emperor's a god, they accept it. That, that's just how cultish the pagan world was back then. Is that there's a god for everything. Uh, let's see, dating. Uh, a lot of people want to try to put the dating of Revelation out somewhere in like the second or third century someplace, which is absurd. 
Um, of course, they say John didn't write it, so that makes it easier. Um, that's nonsense. The, <laughs> the stuff the liberal scholars always do with dating the Bible is they try to push it out because they can make their argument that uh, against authorship and against eyewitness accounts easier if they could push it out a couple hundred years. That's absurd. There's no evidence for that. Uh, it is about, the traditional dating is around the year AD 95, uh, which is about, about kosher. That's the end of the emperor Domitian's reign. So John is an old man uh, by now. He is the only apostle who died of old age while the other ones were martyred. Uh, some believe that some modern scholars believe a date as early as 68 is more probable, probable, and their argument being that John makes no mention of the destruction of the temple uh, or the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Therefore, they conclude the book had to end before those events. And no, that's not really an argument uh, because the book's not about Jerusalem. <laughs> It's about the new, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, so that's not really, uh, that's an argument from silence. You can't make that argument because it doesn't talk about it. It must have been before it happened. You, no, you can't do that. Uh, so around 95, which makes sense. Uh, there's evidence, overwhelming evidence uh, in favor of that date. Um, the fact that John makes no mention of temple worship still occurring at the time of writing this book does add weight to that argument that the temple has already been destroyed. He's not talking about it. He's talking about heavenly things. So author, St. John, uh, the only apostle who died a natural death. He tells us four times his name is John. Uh, the Greek name uh, Ionis is a form of the Hebrew name Yohanan, uh, which means uh, Yahweh is gracious. Uh, very common name for the Jews in the first century, and obviously John's a common name today. Uh, the fact that John considered it unnecessary to identify himself any further than I'm John was that everybody knew who he was, which adds to the fact that he was a well-known figure, which if he is the old man, the last apostle, come on, he's going to be kind of famous, right? Yeah. Uh, th there are arguments for other folks, but not. There, there's, the best evidence is for that is St. John the Apostle. The early church fathers said it was St. John the Apostle. We have all their writing. Um, who is the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, the author of the fourth gospel, the author of the three epistles that bear his name, and the book of Revelation. So tradition indicates that St. John spent the last years of his life in the Greek city of Ephesus, uh, which is on the western coast of the Roman province of Asia. I knew these would come in handy one of these days. So, not big enough. Not big enough. Not big enough. Oh, wait. <laughs> so, Asia Minor. This is Asia Minor in those days. Hey, look at that. It's almost like I taught this class before. Maps for everybody. All right. So if you look really, really carefully, uh, where is Patmos? So Patmos, which we're going to talk about next, is right out here, a little tiny island. Mm -hmm. All right. That's where John is in prison, which we'll talk about in a second. on the west coast, Smyrna, no, no, no. why am I doing this myself? I have a whole section of maps, timelines maps. So really, it's all the maps I gave you? Anyway, over here somewhere is Ephesus. Uh, since John saw the fulfillment of the signs that Jesus warned about, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. 
Uh, it's conjectured that John fled Jerusalem before it was destroyed and got to Ephesus around the year 69 or 70. And the church fathers further indicate that he was banished from that city to the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is a penal colony. So it is a mining, it was a, a mining colony. Uh, so bad people got sent there. It was basically a prison camp. And from there, for whatever reason, like just like today, you can get some special treatment when you're in prison. So he was able to write letters and send them out. And that's how we got the book of Revelation. They're sent as letters to churches, uh, the churches of whom he was the bishop. Is he bribing prison guards? Probably. Uh, let's see. So then this was during the persecution of the, the Roman Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 AD. Uh, St. Jerome wrote in the 14th year after Nero Domitian, having raised a second persecution, John was banished to the island of Patmos and wrote the Apocalypse, on which Justin Martyr and Irenaeus later wrote commentaries. But Domitian, having been put to death, and his acts on account of his excessive cruelty, having been annulled by the Senate, he returned to Ephesus under Nerva Pertinax, and continuing there until the time of Emperor Trajan, founded and built churches throughout all Asia, and worn out by old age, died in the 69th year after our Lord's Passion, and was buried near the same city. So that was written by um, St. Jerome. And let's see, Nerva Pertinax would have been a governor, and then 69 years after our Lord's Passion, so that's like 70, 100 101-ish, 98, 99, 100, 101 AD is about when John That was very old for back then, wasn't it? Not really. That's a common misperception, too, is that the average life expectancy was lower because child mortality was so high. So if like, you made it past like five and you had a decent diet, yeah, you would live to be old. Like those okay. Roman Emperor, A lot of these Roman Emperor guys, they were old. I mean, they lived to be old age. Yeah, so it's a common misspell. People only live to be about 40 on average. But if you made it out of childhood, most people didn't. So you had a bunch of kids because three-fourths of them are going to die. Um, and then, of course, diet has a lot to do with it. Wealth has a lot to do with it, just like it does today, actually. Uh, but, yeah. All right, and this is also in keeping with the testimony we'll see inside the text itself, which says that uh, at the time when the revelation came to John, he was on the Isle of Patmos on account of the word of God, which means I'm preaching, somebody didn't like that, now I'm in jail for it, right? Just like Paul and Peter. Uh, the style in writing in Revelation is very similar to the Gospel of John uh, and also the three epistles, even though they're different kinds of writing. Um, but there's no doubt they're written by the same guy. If you read them, and I'm a John guy, that's my my big focus in scripture has always been John. Uh, and it's like, yeah, they're, it just sounds like John, just like you can tell when something sounds like Paul. And then you read something like Hebrews and go, it doesn't sound like anybody. kind of sounds like Paul, but not really. Like it's a student of Paul. Uh, John was the bishop of the 12 churches of Asia Minor, and he wrote to them, like when he wrote this book, in a kind of coded language that only they would understand, uh, using picture language from the Old Testament. Now, that's not to say John didn't see these things in his vision the way he wrote them. Yeah, he, he did. These are visions. But even the original language is weird. Okay, the, like the original, not like if you open up a Greek New Testament and read it, it's all in nice paragraphs, just like we have it translated English. In the manuscript evidence, it leaves off in the middle of sentences. It just stops and then it starts again later. Almost like somebody was having a vision and writing stuff down. How about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the original language and the, and the, and the even the manuscript copies, it's just, it, it's bizarre. Um, the original language is very difficult because it's not good Greek. It's not even John's Greek. John's Greek John's the first gospel you read when you learn Greek because it's easy and it's simple and it, it's good Greek, but it's simple Greek. It's written for a, like a, a younger child to be able to understand it. Um, Revelation is not. It's full of Semitisms. It sounds like someone who originally learned to speak Aramaic and is translating in his head 
to Greek in a hurry, and he's just kind of transliterating Aramaic into Greek sometimes. Uh, so it's definitely, you can tell it's a native Semitic speaker of a Semitic language writing in a rush, not thinking it through like you would doing something polished. And they get all of that out of the original language. Um, again, some like someone who was writing down a vision quickly before he forgot all the details. Um, and John uses that coded language because he's the bishop of 12 churches. So when the bishop of 12 churches starts sending letters out of prison, they're going to follow it because now they'll find out where the leaders of the 12 churches are and we can put them in jail next. So he writes it in code because then he's not going to get in trouble because the Roman authorities are going to open the letter and they're going to read it and they're going, what's this? And it's like, I don't know, it's some of that Hebrew crap that the Jews write. It's fine, let it go. There's nothing that identifies as necessarily Christian. So that keeps them safe. But they will get it, they will read it, and they will understand it way better than we do. Uh, because, again, they know the Old Testament like we don't. So, and a non-Christian would read it and make absolutely no sense of this. It's like, that. Yeah, this makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and which is why we have trouble with it today. Okay, so the Old Testament is huge for understanding the book of Revelation. Uh, Isaiah 6 is the foundational vision that John draws out of uh, because the vision of Christ enthroned is the central image of the whole book. Uh, Ezekiel is also very important. Ezekiel was written around 593 BC before the destruction of the first temple. Uh, chapter one of Ezekiel is again the throne vision, uh, which is, and Ezekiel is the basis for a lot of the imagery in um, Revelation. And Ezekiel, like John, received a prophetic call and is given several visions. And we have that vision of the the, the uh, angelic beings and the vehicles with the wheels within wheels and the eyes within and without. And you're like reading that going, what is this? Yeah, Ezekiel. Yay. And the imagery from that is pulled right into Revelation 2. Also Daniel, uh, chapter 7 to 12, which was also written in a time of crisis, just like this time for the Christians like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, like Revelation, uh, and this phrase, which comes from Daniel, one like a son of man. Uh, and he's going to use that phrase in Revelation a lot, which Jesus used for himself. Jesus never called himself the Christ. He called himself the son of man, which is a messianic title from the Old Testament. Uh, and Daniel had heavy, heavy influence on Jewish apocalyptic literature. So now we got to talk about what is apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is uh, literature that has to do with uh, end times. Eschatology is the fancy term for it. So anything that has to do with the end times, but it's not just about the end. It's like, oh, it's about the end of the world. Well, that's what happens at the end of the end times. But the end times are a process. And Jewish people loved apocalyptic literature. And they absolutely ate it up. There was all kinds of it, not necessarily scriptural. It was like kind of like entertainment. And well, we have that today. It sounds, it sounds familiar. We have post like what's everybody's favorite one of the favorite most beloved genres of, of fiction is is post apocalyptic dystopia. Yeah. So dystopia, a world twisted out of recognition. Post apocalyptic after the end, after the end, but it's still here. Hmm. But after the, the worldwide disaster, meteor, EMP, nuclear holocaust, whatever, this is how people struggle to survive. We love that stuff, right? Makes for great, great movies, great novels. Well, the Jewish people love that kind of literature too. There's all kinds of apocalyptic literature. And there's apocalyptic literature in the Bible. Those few chapters of Daniel are apocalyptic. Parts of Ezekiel, a lot of Ezekiel is apocalyptic. Isaiah, Jeremiah, there's apocalyptic literature and, of course, Revelation. Uh, and because of because you have these Old Testament visions in their apocalyptic literature, especially of the heavenly throne room, uh, there is a great interest among Jews in that heavenly throne room. Like, what does that look like? And they talk about that kind of stuff in Jewish apocalyptic literature. And another one is the Book of Enoch, uh, which I've read a lot in the Book of Enoch. Um, the Ethiopian church actually has it in their Bible. They consider it scripture. There's some bizarre stuff in there, like really weird stuff, but apocalyptic, it's interesting. 
Uh, let's see. Yeah. And, the, and then the reason we find it so interesting is that, like, of course, you get a vision of heaven. You're like, what's heaven going to be like? And you go, well, the earthly temple's gone, right? The second temple's gone. So the temple was modeled after the throne room in heaven. It's a copy. And our sanctuary today is modeled after the temple, which is modeled after the throne room in heaven. So we, we copy what we can from the throne room in heaven. That's the way, way God gave the instructions for the tabernacle, for the temple. He gave us the instructions. Well, this is what it's got to look like because this is what my throne room looks like. And so you're going to make a little copy of it on earth. Okay. And the Jews started writing a lot of this apocalyptic literature because if you read in the, Apoc in the Apocrypha, in the book of 1 Maccabees, uh, which is a history of the Maccabean Rebellion, it tells you there's no prophetic voice in the land because after Malachi, the prophets stopped speaking until John the Baptist, and then he was the last prophet. But all in between that intertestamental time, there are no prophets bringing the word of God to people. There's silence. And which is why they were so excited when John the Baptist showed up, first of all. And it knows that there, were, there was trauma in the land. People needed hope. God stopped talking to them like they were used to. Uh, they looked toward the heavenly reality because things are getting bad on earth. And so they started writing all of this kind of literature to kind of make them feel better. And it was entertaining. They enjoyed it. Uh, so they looked at what's at that time, scripture had for them to give them hope in the heaven to come, and they wrote this other literature because, you know, it helps them work, it helps us work out in our minds, well, what's it going to be like when the world ends? And that kind of stuff makes us feel good because it's like, that's not as bad, that's worse than what it is now, so we don't have it so bad. So it, bring, it brings comfort, even though it's incredible. Uh, some of the Jews who wrote some of that apocalyptic literature may have been writing from experience. I'm not going to say they never had visions. Uh, we know from modern psychology that people can work themselves up into a frenzy and see visions, even though their brain's creating them, uh, with the assistance of psychoactive drugs or even just being so enthusiastic with uh, getting worked up with a crowd, they can make themselves reach a hysteria where they actually see stuff. They see things. They hallucinate. Uh, most of the writers, however, used the Old Testament visions from the apocalyptic literature in the Bible as their starting place. Because, you know, there's no, nothing original in art, right? So they always use something as a launching pad, which made sense why John then would base his visions or the visions he saw were rooted in that because he was raised with all those stories. Uh, and then it wouldn't be surprised when it's like, oh yeah, it's another book about that throne room thing. You know, We confiscated a, like a cart full of those books from Josephus the other day. <laughs> then uh, first uh, Enoch, chapters 37 to 71, the chapters aren't that long, um, is the, probably the most important text we have for understanding the Jewish expectation of the Messiah, which would, as we know was mistaken. They were longing through for God enthroned, the enthroned Son of Man, the Messiah, to be enthroned on earth, ruling here among us, uh, which is not the way it's actually going to happen. So when we look at the apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament, which we'll be reading some of it, and the Jewish apocalyptic literature of the first century, and then we read Revelation, we'll see that Revelation is not so weird that just popped up out of the blue. It's like this had never been seen before. Well, what it's saying has been seen before because it's in the rest of the Bible and it's just being written another way. But the actual idea of having all these visions together in a book, this is nothing new. You know, like again, people, the Jews would even pick it up and go, oh, I've not read this one before. What's this one about? Oh, it's about that Jesus fellow. Yeah. But they'll still go, hey, it's pretty good because it's got all these, they love that kind of literature. It's fiction, so I'm going to read it. Uh, Revelation was right up people's alley. Even the new Christians would have loved this. They're not great going, look at what John just sent us from prison. I think he's getting whacked out. They're like, look what John sent us from prison. This is cool. Listen because they would have understood all of it. All right, so up until the destruction of the temple in 70, that is the literature of the day. 
Okay, so people still wrote poetry, people still wrote plays, right? People, the novel as a thing hasn't really quite happened yet or is happening uh, in the pagan world. But uh, the Jews started redefining themselves after the temple was destroyed because that's the center of their life. Even if you're not in Jerusalem, you come for the big feast. So after that, they have to start reassessing like, whoa, the temple's gone. We don't do sacrifices. How's this going to work? Uh, and they started redefining their literature. And now they started looking more toward laws that govern their day-to-day -day life, uh, how they should live, uh, because they started focusing on what they do in this life rather than on the heavenly reality of the coming Messiah, because one, they missed the boat because he came and went already, and they don't know what to do. They're completely lost, and they've been kind of lost ever since. And also, there is now a Jewish mysticism that's going to arise, and that's where we get Kabbalah and all the other weird stuff starts coming out of out of that after the destruction of the temple. So, an apocalypse. First, we'll get the word apocalypse out of the way. So, the word revelation is the name of our book. Uh, in some Bibles, you'll see it just called apocalypse. They're the same word. Okay, one's Latin, one's Greek. The Greek word is apocalypsis, which means the revealing. That's all it is. There's, there's no, oh, apocalyptic. It just means revealing. We've, we've turned it to mean something horrific and big and, and world-ending and dramatic. It just means a revealing as in, okay, I am going to you know, apocalypse the next page. I'm going to reveal the next page. That's what it means. So it's an unveiling of a divine mystery. It's not just a prophecy of the future. Um, eschatology, per se, that fancy word, deals with the future alone. So Revelation is an apocalypse. It's not just about eschatology. It's an unveiling of a divine mystery, not just a divine mystery about the future. Uh, an apocalypse always employs figurative and symbolic language uh, to convey the message. Apoca apocalyptic literature is never meant to be read literally which you never ever hear a Lutheran say that about anything in the Bible ever again. Because we're like, God, we read the Bible literally. Well, we read Revelation literally as the type of literature it is. If it's written as symbolism, we got to understand the symbols. If it's written as an eyewitness account, we read it as an eyewitness account. Apocalyptic literature is never written in plain text. It's always shrouded, uh, shrouded in, in symbolism. And the symbolism and all the imagery has to be understood if you want to come to a literal understanding of its message. So anyone who claims otherwise does not understand how to read apocalyptic literature. So if they say, I'm going to read it from chapter 1 to chapter end, and this is going to happen in this order. They have no idea what they're talking about. Stop listening to them. They do not know how to read this book. Uh, because you're going to see the world end seven times, and the world's not going to end seven times. It just means, okay, this vision's over, the next vision started. Actually, one vision actually will start the next vision, and it does this. It actually gets bigger every time it goes around. And that's a John thing, and we'll see that. So we have all kinds of key scenes and concepts, but the big concept is the idea of the heavenly throne room. That is our big anchor and we're going to come to it again and again. Um, chapter 4 and 5 is actually the climax of the book because that is going to be like the key scene of the heavenly throne room. And then in the rest of the vision, we're going to see pieces, parts, but we've already seen the big thing, which is the eternal heavenly reality uh, that we and all believers participate in now and will in the world to come which is to remind us that you know, the victory is ours, the victory is won, Christ already did it all. Even in the suffering of this world, yeah, the eternal victory has already been completed and won. All right, so this is going to be Christian politics. What's Christian politics? It shows that all earthly political powers come and go, but the heavenly reality, the true power, always exists. And then we are going to see the sevenfold vision, you're going to see the seven seals, the you know, four horsemen of the apocalypse, and we're going to see the seven trumpets, we're going to see the seven bowls. There's a number seven again that keeps coming up in scripture. Numbers mean things too, we'll talk about that. We're going to see the reality between Christ's first and second coming. 
That's what all these visions are going to do. Uh, there are going to be broad portraits of what goes on in the world in every generation as we go toward the end of days. Uh, they don't particularly show any particular events. It's like, oh, you know, in Revelation, that shows when that guy in the Middle East is going to show. No, it doesn't. It's no specific thing. It's going to be things that happen and happen again and happen again. Uh, let's see. And it's going to show us, and it actually is comforting us because, yeah, the, it's happened before. It's going to happen again. And guess what? God's still in control. That's a good thing. The lamb that opens the seals of the book, he's the one in control. Uh, we're going to see escalation with these sevenfold visions, too. We're going to see that there's an interlude that takes place uh, weirdly before one vision ends and the next one be uh, begins. But we're going to see things keep getting worse every time we go through these visions. Like, this one was worse than the last one. Yeah, it's intensifying. It's showing it. Yeah, as you get closer to the end, it's going to get really bad. And they just doop, 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 doop. Now let's see. Revelation shows the effect of sin on a fallen world. Um, Revelation is going to ask us the question, what city do you belong to? Because there's going to be this list of cities at the beginning. Uh, do you belong to Babylon? The big question, do you belong to Babylon or do you believe, belong to Jerusalem? Uh, we're going to see two types of, it's going to be black and white, there's going to be two, and it's a John thing. Every, there is no shades of gray with John. It's, you know, you are either, you either believe or you're damned. You are either one of us or you're against us. Uh, you are either of Babylon or of Jerusalem. Uh, and that is going to be the question he asks us to believe, to, to answer. There's no middle ground with him ever. Uh, Revelation is written to comfort us and to assure believers that we belong to a heavenly reality that even in the middle of the trouble and turmoil and suffering in this world, our reality is already victorious. The world can't destroy it. The world will be destroyed, but the world can't destroy our reality. And it also shows us the reality of sin and its effect. Uh, and from instead of shying away from the sin and the evil that will exist in this world till Christ returns, Revelation is going to depict it with extreme imagery extremely vivid imagery, and you're going to go, yeah, that's happening right now. Okay? So the message throughout this entire book is the world is broken. Satan is in charge of it. This is his domain. It's, he owns it. He is the prince of this world. He's thrusting his evil everywhere. But we share in the victory of Christ over sin, death, and the devil. So even that doesn't matter. Okay? So John is... I said John Baptist was the last prophet. John the Apostle is the last prophet. He is a prophet, just like the Old Testament prophets. He's writing a prophecy. Prophecy is not always about the future. Prophecy is delivering the message, the words of God to the people, and he is doing that. A biblical prophet talks about all of reality, past, present, and future. John very much is doing that. Okay, so there are four main types of literature in the Bible, history, wisdom, prophecy, an apocalypse. So we understand history. It tells you about things that actually happened. Wisdom, like Psalms, Solomon, Proverbs, right? All that stuff. It's wisdom, prophecy, God giving his word to people to then speak to his people, and then apocalypse, as we talked about. Um, yeah. So symbolism, we will learn, like, everything means something in this book. Colors, numbers, uh, objects, what they look like. They all have meanings. Uh, some things we don't actually know what they mean. There's like a few little things of Revelation we'll go like, we think it might mean this, but we're not sure. We just don't know because it's lost. We don't, we don't comprehend exactly what they're referring to. And it doesn't matter. It does not impact our story of salvation one bit. There are just things that have been lost to time that we can no longer interpret. Maybe we'll discover something someday that helps, but I doubt it, And but we might. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect everything. Four ways, and then we'll stop probably for today. Before, when did we start? What time was it when we started? I'm really bad at time. Oh, we've only been talking for 41 minutes. Ha. Huh. Forget about that. So there's four ways... Revelation is interpreted in the world. Uh, and there is only one way to do it right. Guess who knows how to do that? You have 
what are called preterists. And the preterists say you can only interpret this book in a first century setting. Sounds reasonable. Then you have uh, historicists. Historicists interpret the book as a long chain of events from the time it was written until the end of time. Okay, that sounds all right. You have futurists, which put everything in the book right toward the end. Like, get running up to the last day, it's going to start happening, and then the end of the days will come. Futurists. And then you have idealists. There's always there's one in every group, the idealist. Idealists view Revelation as symbolic pictures, rich truths of the victory of God over evil. But symbolic pictures, not truth. Okay, they don't believe this stuff's actually happening or going to happen. It's, it's a more of an extended parable, if you will. Okay, so we're Lutherans, so we are historicists. We believe this book is a long chain of events that began at the ascension of Christ and will end when he comes again. Uh, then there's four timelines you can use to outline the book. That I'm not even going to get into that, but there are the millennial view and the amillennial view. So the millennial view is uh, not people in their 30s, thank God. Uh, <laughs> The millennial view is the thousand years that this book talks about is a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And then the devil gets loosed and then the end comes. No. And that is what your popular culture, what you're going to see on radio, TV, on the internet. The majority of the interpretation is going to be millennialist, meaning Jesus comes again and then he goes away and then he comes back. Well, Jesus only says he's going to come back once. You've got Jesus coming back twice. You've already screwed it up. All right? And if you read Revelation like that as a from beginning to end like it's happening consecutively, you wind up with Jesus coming back more than once. You get that if you interpret it that way. It's not a literal thousand-year reign. Numbers have meanings, but they're not necessarily <coughs> literal meanings. It's, it's not going to be a real thousand years. Uh, it's already been 2,000, and it's still going. Uh, revelation is figurative the figurative thousand years if you read it like a, a, a linear story not only do you get Jesus coming back uh, you get all kinds of misinterpretations and heresies including things like the rapture you, you get that if you, if you read revelation that way can't do it uh, John's writing and it's a very I want to say it's rooted in Hebraic thinking. It's a Hebraicism. And then, and then John's writing, it's a spiral. Okay, so he has a starting point and he starts telling the story and it you know, crosses 12 o'clock and repeats. And now he's going to start telling the same story again, a little different way, a little different perspective. And when he gets around to 12 o'clock, it's, it's moving out. It's getting bigger. And he's getting, that spiral keeps going like this and getting bigger and getting bigger and getting bigger till the very end. There are a total of seven visions the number is not accidental. There's seven visions in Revelation, and three of them, the number three is not accidental, three of those visions are sevenfold. They have seven parts. So there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of repetition. And it's from different perspectives. Uh, and that, that spiral escalation, he does that in his letters. He does that in his gospel. So that's a, that very much a John. All right. So that's all background junk. I mean, you could get whole books, the background stuff. It's fascinating. So let's actually look at the book. Revelation chapter 1. We'll, just, we'll only do the first eight verses. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. What is he as we have? Slaves? Instead of bond servants? No, it says his servants. His servants, okay. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Hey, ever wonder where I got that from? There you go. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, I actually want to read that really quick to see how they do that. I mean, the, the content is there, but it's set up a little bit differently paragraphically. Yeah. It's not that horrible. No, it's, it's saying the same thing. It's just, like I say, set up paragraphically a little bit different, a little more modernly. Okay. I like the NASB because they render, they, they what is the Greek word? I think it's like doulamos. Dulos? Dulos. Yeah, the Greek word is dulos, and they translate it as servants in the ESV. NASB translates it as bond servant. Bond servant's better because it is a type of slave, like an indentured servant, which means you can buy your way out of it. And that's what we are. We're bond servants of Christ because he we were slaves to sin and he paid the price for us to be released. So I like that translation better. Yeah, this one here just Seems like it almost like waters it down. What it watered it down to, just servants? Yes, servants. Yeah. 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 And it's like you said, the message is there, but it's just so plain. Yeah, and where, I think King other... ja I think King James actually says slaves. You're like, oh you can't use that word anymore. Whatever. I like some of the older writings with mm -hmm. these, thous, thus. Well and, and the, it's more way more descriptive. Well, and the thing too about that is the English language used to make a distinction between second and third person plurals. Or first and second person plural. So if I say you or you, am I talking to you or both of you? We don't have that in modern English. We lost it. That old English has that, as does every other language on the planet, by the way. But English, it erased it. Uh, but that King James English has that. That's what all the these and thous and what for are like for. Those. Yeah. Okay. So uh, all things said about everything being in code, John does kind of tell you what it's all about right here at the beginning. <laughs> it's about Jesus Christ. It's a story about Jesus, the story of our salvation. All right? and he gave, God gave the, re the revealing, which God gave to Jesus to show his bond servants, his people who were bought by his blood, the things that must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel. Angel just means messenger. So is it an angel, angel? Maybe. But whenever we see the word angel, the literal meaning of angel means a messenger. And that's going to be important here in a minute. Uh, to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God. All right. And now he's going to write to these seven churches, the churches he's a bishop of. And then he starts using a bunch of titles for Jesus. The firstborn of the dead, because he was the first to die and rise, so that we will also die and rise ourselves. Ruler of the kings of the earth, we understand that. And we were released from our sins by his blood. He's made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. There's a good explanation of all that in the book of Hebrews, which we just finished Bible study a couple of weeks ago, where we studied all of the steps to leading to the consecration and ordination of the priests in the Old Testament sacrificial system and what they had to do, and then what they had to do to make their sacrifices for their own sin, and then they could do the sacrifices for the sins of the people, and blah, blah, blah. And now Jesus came, and he's made us all priests because we don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. He was the once for all sacrifice, so now we don't have to stand and do all these. You don't have to have somebody make a sacrifice for you. You can talk to God yourself. There's no intermediary. And that was the point of a great deal of the book of Hebrews. And John just says that in like one, one line, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically says, priest to be to his God and Father, to him be the glory forever. He is coming with the clouds, because he said, the angels said to the disciples when he ascended, well, he's going to come back just the way he saw him leave. So, right? Even those who pierce him and all the tribes of the earth, everybody's going to see him when he comes back. A lot of people are going to go, holy crap, he's real. It's too late. I believe now, too late. Too late, sorry. So the first and the last, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because he was there from before eternity and he will be there after and he is now. So 
Jesus was never made. He always was. All right, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation, who there's a good word we have to talk about, and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things that will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And then I'll go on to the angel of the church in right. And we'll next week start with the seven churches. So we already are getting code, stuff to code, and he actually gives us the key to some of it. There's going to be a lot of this at the beginning, and then once you got it, it'll just make sense from there out. It's, there's really not that much of it, as, as people think. First off, the number seven. The number seven is the number of perfection. So the number seven is God's number, because that is seven usually represents what only God can do, or what he does, or what he will do. So when you see number seven, thank God. Number three, also thank God, because Trinity. Number three almost always refers to the Trinity. It can also mean a limited period of time, uh, depending on the context. And then we'll get to multiplying stuff. It just makes it bigger. So if you see like 3,000, that means a big period of time, right? Uh, the number four, that is the number of man, the number of earth, the number of created things uh, because of the four corners of the earth, you know, the four cardinal compass directions, the number four just refers to the created world. And four plus three equals seven. Because you've got the created world, you have the trinity, and that's everything, kind of. Uh, so the seven lampstands, Jesus tells us, oh, the one, like a son of man, that's Jesus standing there. Uh, but instead of looking like Jesus, he looks like the father. Right, you think of what would, what does the father look like? Well, he's a spirit, so he doesn't look like anything. But when we picture him, he's the old ancient of days, right? The one with the big white hair and the robe and the sash and halo, right? That's what we think of as the father, and then you see Christ depicted in that language, which is right out of Ezekiel, the vision of the ancient of days. And we'll get more into that next time. But uh, so that's, that's our first symbols. And so we have the seven lampstands, which the lampstands, those are the seven candle candle operas in the temple, which what ours in the church are supposed to look at. Ours only have five for some reason here, but they're supposed to have seven. Yeah. Uh, and you can mine that way. I don't know why. So the seven lampstands are the seven churches in Asia Minor that John is going to be told to write to. And then the stars are the angels of the seven churches. So John is going to, and then in chapter two, verse one, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. So why is John writing letters to angels? Because they're messengers, not heavenly beings. Because they're messengers. And so if you're writing to the messenger of the church in Ephesus, who is he? Priest? Yeah, he's the pastor. So the angels of the churches are the pastors. So John, as the bishop, is going to write letters to the pastors of the churches. 
in code because he doesn't want to get those guys in trouble because they're going to be in there right next to him. I got to get something to drink. <coughs> I got to Slides are annoying. Slides are annoying. They had a wedding here yesterday and there's like still pizza out and they didn't clean up. Oh! And the doors are open and you know, hmm? nothing. What? Nothing. Okay. We're talking about the flies. Are they little messengers? Yeah. <laughs> no Lord of the Flies jokes? Come on. That's what Beelzebub means. I've got this great, there's a book that you'll enjoy. It's like an encyclopedia, but you don't want to buy it because it's kind of spendy. But it's, 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 the, it's called the Dictionary of Deities and Demons. It's, we call it the Triple D. It's like a yay thick, good size hardback book. It's basically got every name in the Bible. It's not just gods and demons. What's it called? It's called the Dictionary of Deities and Demons. Like the ebook is 120 bucks. Ouch! Yeah. I actually don't think the hardback's that bad. But it's got every name, you know, like all the like Azazel, Yells above, every demon name you've ever heard in like Jewish mysticism, popular culture, uh, Islam even, I think is there's some stuff in there. And it basically gives you all the like derivation where those names come from, where they are and about what they mean. And it's every name is people too. It's just like great. It's like, what does this name mean? It's in that book. Okay, so he's writing to the seven pastors of these seven churches. What? <laughs> Did you see something that the hardcover might not be that bad? Yeah, well, it's four hundred dollars. Oh, it's a bit used. Yeah, because it's still in print. Used is four hundred dollars. Yeah, I didn't pay that much for mine. Oh, wow, inflation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I need another job. Yeah, it's because they. Well, you know, it's not exactly a wide audience. There's only one other person I know that actually has that in his library, and that's Freddie. Of course. Of course it is, right. Exactly. All these books are so expensive, though. Yeah, some of this stuff's weird. Yeah, but some of the weirdest stuff to read is free. You just go on the internet and read it for free, like the Book of Enoch. All three of them are on there, in whatever language you want to read it in. <laughs> it's bizarre. Like I said, the Church of Ethiopia has it right in their Bible. Oh, Enoch's $13. There you go. Uh, it's got one, probably one of the best calendars. You know, like everybody kept making calendars because it didn't actually match the year. The calendar in the book of Enoch is like right on. It's like even Caesar still had, you know, leap year to deal with. Mm. Yeah. So we're going to see next week, what we'll see is each one of these letters, and here's the map I was looking for, of course. Every letter is going to have a pattern. It's going to have a little <clears throat> detail about that church. It's going to have an image of Jesus. It's going to have a summary of what Jesus sees in that church, and that's going to be the good and the bad. And it's going to have a call to repentance, and it's going to have a promise or a blessing. And then we'll see these sub church. Well, there's one that doesn't get a blessing, and that's not good. But... It's neat to look at the seven churches and decide which church our church is. Why which one we like. Well, why didn't one of them get a blessing? Uh, because they sucked. They were not good. <laughs> they were in trouble. There's only one. Are we going to go through Revelation if we go through, like, Acts? Mm-hmm. Sweet. Because I have questions, but I don't want to jump ahead. Okay. Well, what's your question? No, like it's like way at the end. I can wait. Oh, okay. Because I know you don't like cherry picking either. This all will be revealed. Oh. That was not even a good joke. I know. All will be apocalypsed. I'm going to start using that word more. No. no. You know what? We got to apocalypse that. Why? Why do you? Why do you want to do that? It sounds mean. I don't think you want to destroy it. it must be revealed, huh? That's funny. It's a little funny. It's a little funny. Yeah, it's the, this, you, this is my Friday, so this is like I'm I'm, I'm out. Oh yeah, you have to <laughs> okay. Monday, though. Yeah. But they just use the word soon a lot, like you know when he says coming soon. Okay, Charlie, yeah, because I don't think you know what that word means. Yeah, so I don't think I don't think that means word means what you think it means. I knew you would get that. There was a Ren and Stimpy. It's like well, 
Well, there was a run, Stimpy, and, and Stimpy says, well, we'll see you guys later. He's talk, breaking the fourth wall, talking to the audience. We'll see you guys later. Stimpy's like, but when? Soon. How soon is that? <laughs> yeah, come Lord Jesus. When? Soon. Really? It sounds very relative. Mm -hmm. It is relative. Yeah. So, so that's where we'll, we'll leave it. That's really all the introductory stuff. So we'll leave it there, and we'll start talking about the seven churches next week, which is chapters two and three. Yeah, chapters two and three. Mm -hmm. Then we get our first look at the throne room, and then we get into the good stuff in the book. The reason we all read it, that's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which is in chapter six. So first we have to see chapter chapters four and five. That's our vision of the throne room, and a look at Jesus, and then we get the Four Horsemen. Of which in art, there are only like one painting of the Four Horsemen Apocalypse that actually gets the colors correct according to the hmm. Bible, according to the original language. Who's the Slater? I think Slater too. I used to actually have those in my eyes. Not so much. Because if I don't know, it's going to put me. Promise, promise. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't the blessing. It's one he tells something good and bad about every church. But there's one he doesn't say anything good about. That's it. the Bodocia. Yeah, I Laodicea. I don't pronounce things correctly. I know. Who did the correct painting? I don't remember. I don't remember the name. I only know is when you look at the white horse, he's not white. He's like like a sick looking green, which is actually what color he's supposed to be. Uh, Laodicea, yes. Okay. See, that's one last thing I got to email you about. Where it will actually do some fun Greek words because there's a lot of fun Greek words in this book. Oh, what is that name? Koros. Koros is the name of the color of the pale, pale horse they translated because there's not a good word in English for sickly, ghostly, Scooby Doo monster green, which is what that color is. It's the Koros, it's where we get our word like chlorophyll and Clorox and all that stuff. That. That's it. Uh, if you grow a cucumber, the side that's to the ground that you turn over and it's this so little that little yellow, green. that's exactly that uh, color. It's like a dead color. Yeah, it's corpse, corpse yeah. color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what that word means when they say, oh, and this. That is a great vision. It's like it's not a pale horse. It's a, it looks like a Scooby-Doo ghost. It's a dead cucumber horse. Yeah, so, so why is there a dead cucumber yeah. horse? In Scooby-Doo, the way some of those zombies look that yeah. pale green. Isn't that creepy? Yeah, not at all. Yeah, so original languages matter. Um, yeah, I agree with you. And there's a lot of great art. I'll bring, I've, I've got a book from the Middle Ages. It's in French, but it's a commentary on Revelation. It has really cool engravings in it. And I'll bring my, my replica of the 1544 Luther Bible, which has all the copies of the original engravings in the Luther Bible for Revelation, which are like nuts. Because they do everything, because they're Germans, they do everything literal. So if he has legs like pillars, the guy's got like legs that look like pillars on a temple. <laughs> it's crazy. I want to see this. Yeah, they're, they're goofy looking. Some this of them are goofy. the best picture I found all week. I was in love with that picture. Nice. Hmm. I put it on now are the, the four horsemen supposed to be literal? 